<laughs> all right. Well, normally, and uh, unfortunately for all of you new people, uh, at this point, uh, our friend Matt Gordon from Expected Behavior would get up and give a, an interesting uh, news presentation on news from the last month. However, he could not be here today. Uh, so we are going to just discuss the news until it gets out of hand and everybody's bored out of their mind and then we're going to move on. So if I can recall correctly, Dave Jones, what you told me should be news today was uh, Rails 4 was announced that and it will be 1.9.x only, correct? Correct. So there's that. Everybody heard about that? That's pretty cool. What, what are the, I didn't even hear about that. What are the Big features. That's not right now. <laughs> they, but they are going to name Rails 4. That's yes. Awesome. They wanted they wanted to start developing ahead with Ruby 1.9 only. They wanted to use 1.9 only features. So they said this is 4 now, and it's Ruby 1.9 only, and that's that's pretty much everything that's been decided about 4. Especially one is a pretty big change. Yeah. There's a lot of some practical changes. I realize there's probably lots of discussion that happened around that particular decision, but it kind of seemed like one day, like DHH was talking to himself on Twitter, and then was like, you know what? Uh, 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 Rails head is four now, and it's 1.9 only. So that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and coffee script. Right. No. Uh, we, have have, we have to have a new one this time. What should it be? A new thing to make everybody angry. That's really kind of trivial. Hamel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Real scores Hamel only. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Yeah. By default. Uh, must you, you can comment down the line and get ERB back. Right. <laughs> Dave Jones, what was the other thing? You don't remember? Do we need to move on? I don't know. Uh, it was also deprecated in 3.2. Head uh, 3.2 RC2 is out. Oh, yeah. And that should be coming up pretty soon. Rails Because they moved from 3.1 or... Is there anything that's just bug fixes? No, I think this is the, the start track of where they're going for the next major version. 3.2. I don't know what all is big and different about it other than they're deprecating they 187 and plugins. They don't like that. Plugins, so. It's supposed to be the road, the road to 4.0, I believe. That's right. No more plugins in Rails 4, right? Mm -hmm. Right. How does everybody feel about that? No plugins in Rails 4. Those of you with Rails experience, cool. <laughs> That's pretty does, any, does anybody actually still use plugins for stuff? Everybody, yeah. for some things. I feel like I'm gonna have to gemify some other people's old plugins. You know what I mean? Which is kind of a pain point. But eh. once we figured out that you could install gems from private repositories on GitHub, all of our use cases for plugins disappeared. Oh. Because it's a gem file, you just put some magic and then you don't need plugins anymore. I still work on a lot of 2.3 apps, which you can't do engines and gems in 2.3. You have to do it in a plugin if you want to do an engine. So that's super annoying. And the thing I've had to do. do. People use engines a lot? Just you? Apparently just me. Just. <laughs> I actually haven't used, so what, what's, uh, um, what have you used it for? Them? Uh, I made a plugin to do fake web. You guys heard fake web? Mm -hmm. uh, to do multi process fake web, basically. If you want to run your tests and use fake web and you're using the tests with multiple processes, fake web is only in one process. So you've got to basically send that, you know, the URL you're fake webbing and what you want the response to be across to the other process. So I was like, I'll make a little, I'll make an engine to do this thing. Uh, and so they just communicate with each other and pick web whatever you want to test with each other. But so it's a route, you know, it's a route and a controller, a little tiny controller, and okay, it's it's pretty small, but but it needs it example. needs all of the engine stuff as opposed to just being a, a gem or something. Right. I want it to be. I want it to add its own route and have its own you know controller and all that stuff. Cool. Refinery CMS is an engine, and we did. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, add functionality to it by creating more engines for Refinery CMS. And so right. we did lots of that on authorlearningcenter.com, which Dustin now gets to maintain all my crap code. But Interesting. And add more stuff. I haven't created one yet. But. But, but when we were building it, like we wanted to be able to do, Refinery is just a basic CMS. 
So we wanted to add the ability to have upload videos to it. So we had to add an engine for videos and basically every separate layout that you want can be a, a separate engine. And anyway, I'm already confused. It's just a way <laughs> to add crap to it. <laughs> Sounds cool. Really, I think the lesson is just work on new apps so you don't have to deal with plugins. <laughs> yeah. Yes, work on new apps so you don't have to deal with legacy code. Exactly. I like this idea. <laughs> it's, it's the Rails way. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You maybe mentioned the uh, white cats, um, you know, talking about uh, adding blocks to the and all the background. And, uh, it's true. Uh, we were just discussing this before the meetup started, and I sent this link out yesterday via Twitter. Um, Yehuda Katz uh, used to be big in the Ruby and Rails community, not that he isn't still. Uh, he does mostly JavaScript, working on the Ember JS framework at the moment. Uh, and he yesterday wrote a long post, so really this isn't Ruby, it's more on the JavaScript side, but uh, he touches on Ruby and uses Ruby as an example. Wrote a long blog post about how um, JavaScript currently has functions as, as first class citizens, essentially, um, but does not have blocks. Uh, like Ruby has blocks where, this is gonna be difficult for me to actually explain without you guys just like staring at me like I wish you would shut up. Um, in a block in Ruby, if you call, if you tell it to return from that block, it actually floats up and returns from the, the uh, surrounding method as opposed to just exiting the block. Um, whereas, when you try to do a similar thing using a function in JavaScript, it's just going to return from that function, like a callback, for instance, if you're familiar with that uh, style of JavaScript programming. Uh, so if you were to return from a callback, it just returns from that callback. It doesn't float up to the, the next containing function like a block would in Ruby. So he argued uh, essentially for adding blocks to JavaScript. Um, but it was a pretty interesting article. So if you... Uh, I think it's yehudacats.com, and cats is spelled K-A-T-Z. Uh, you can find that, that particular article. And then if you go to Hacker News, if you're familiar with news.ycombinator.com, uh, there's a whole long discussion with a ton of back and forth between him and a bunch of other uh, uh, strong programmers with strong opinions uh, on Hacker News. It's pretty interesting, including a few people who are like, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about because he likes Ruby. Actually, just along that line, if you actually want to get around that, you use lambda instead of the block. You can still use that as a block. And what? I'm sorry. So if you, if you have a return, mm -hmm. lambda, then the return actually applies as if it were a function. But you can oh. use that as a block. Okay. It's going to handle it. It's like lambda versus proc. So proc is more like a self-contained uh, block, whereas a lambda is just be more like a self-contained function. Right. So if you actually return, it's not, it's not returning out the entire scope. Right. Yeah. The lambda's, I mean, secretly lambda's just shorthand for proc.new, isn't it? Um, no, I think there's a, there's a distinction. So I think proc you can't return from. It returns, it, it, I think, I'll look it up. I've got some code where I had to deal with both. And so you, you might be right where they're equivalent. But I know it, if you compared to a normal block return, like you say, it's kind of a, a cat, something that will certainly, uh, you know, people run into at some point in time. Will, Think, oh yeah, I can return, and it's it'll like it'll be almost like uh, you know, kind of build it, you know, first you'll be returned back, and you get that that at that out of the block. Mm -hmm. and then you x the function, but I think uh, lambda you can face return, but I think prof you can't lose the return out. I think one of them also complains that you do the wrong number of arguments, and the other one doesn't. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Minor differences that. Why, why would we you want pass that a in a number of arguments, <laughs> Jason? <laughs> Don't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the compiler can catch it. <laughs> Actually, would one of you two be willing to just hit my space bar every once in a while? Not yet. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to go into uh, my presentation, which is less presentation and more what I'm looking for is uh, some discussion amongst all of us. I think uh, we found a few meetings ago that um, something that involves more discussion between all of us ultimately I think makes the meeting more fun. We always know each other a little bit better. Uh, but more than anything we get to really uh, talk, we all get to really talk about something that we're clearly passionate about or we wouldn't be here. Uh, so today I just want to talk about books. Um, 
Yeah, you can hit it now, I think. <laughs> I actually don't really remember what my slides say. So, uh, so, you know, obviously not so much fiction books. I don't really need to talk about Lord of the Rings or like the Mistborn trilogy or anything like that, although it's good. Uh, really want to talk about books that we as programmers, as professionals, what we should be reading. And I want to know more what you think I should read or what you think we should read. Um, I'm probably not as well read as I should be. Uh, I did not finish a computer science degree, uh, so I don't, I haven't read Gang of Four and, or uh, the algorithms book, with, whose actual introduction algorithms or anything like that. Um, and maybe I've also missed some of the other uh, books that would have been suggested to me in computer science, for instance, or something along that line. So I'm still, I'm kind of, play, I feel like I'm playing catch up with all of the books that we should read. Um, so all of this is fair game, including business stuff, because you know we have some people from Startup Weekend in the back, and a lot of us have been to Startup Weekend in the past, and I think a lot of us uh, that are passionate about our profession and our craft are also uh, oftentimes passionate about uh, the business side of things as well. Uh, whether that means you know doing our own thing and, and building a little you know one man business, or whether that means uh, not only you know programming to help the business you're working for, but also, you know, getting more involved uh, uh, from all facets and trying to make, you know, whoever you work for uh, a better business overall. Space Bar Me. Yeah, all those. Space Bar Me again. See, this is why I should have. I need a clicker. Uh, so really, those, that's, those are the things that we should read about. Uh, I want to know specifically books. What should we read? Um, so what book do you think I should read and really why? So, you know, lots of people um, will say, well, you need to read these five books. But maybe, um, maybe Eli just doesn't know me very well. And he doesn't know that, in reality, uh, I don't plan to ever do anything with uh, Erlang, and he really thinks I need to read this Erlang book. No, that's not always appropriate. Maybe I should read, for instance, The Little Schemer because of the way it's going to make me think about stuff like recursion. Uh, even if I never write any scheme, but anyway, give me some, give me a why. Space uh, So obviously we are the Ruby group, so we should probably start off with discussing Ruby books uh, that should be read, and this could be helpful for some of you people who are new. Also, do you guys read this all right? Should I shut off a light? Good. All right. So the obvious one <laughs> is Programming Ruby by Dave Thomas, and I think he gets some help from some other people. Um, Andy Hunt, and I don't remember who else, perhaps, on that book. Uh, it's also known as the Pickaxe, mostly because there's a Pickaxe on the cover, and we get tired of saying Programming Ruby for some reason. Yep. How dated are those books? This has a new version for Ruby 1.9. Um, the Ruby Way has at least a second edition. Um, I'm not sure specifically how much of 1.9 it covers, or if it covers 1.9. This has a newer Rails 3 version. There's a 4 also. What? There's a 4 also. Uh, you mean a, like a version 4? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and then the Rails 3 way came out. Actually coincided, I think, approximately with the release of Rails 3. So, um, like this isn't going, and maybe this, I, neither of these maybe are going to have the asset pipeline stuff uh, that is in Rails 3.1, which is a, um, I mean, if that's the only thing it doesn't cover, it's, and, and you're new to Rails, it's still, it's still definitely worth, worth picking up, especially since, um, and I don't, I don't know how much sense this is going to make to you, this asset, asset pipeline feature is a new way to do a thing in Rails 3.1. You can still do it the old way, though, so not that big of a deal. Are there any other books besides these four that people think uh, Ruby programmers should definitely read? Uh, the one I always recommend is the Walk Around the Rubyist by David Black. And uh, I mean, I I don't feel like I've read enough books, that, but I get most of those just because they're the most well-known ones. And for whatever reason, the Walk Around the Rubyist made more sense to me because it kind of it, it talked about uh, kind of the core elements of Ruby and the elegance of the language and understanding it you know, from the ground up. Those, those 
in some ways for you those kind of references. Yeah. Not very good ones in some cases. Yeah. I, yeah, I've heard like programming Ruby is like every edition since it's come out. And it's like in some ways, you know, I, I just miss the, the, the elegance and beauty of, of KR, you know, for a language book. Mm -hmm. um, programming Ruby in some ways I know that some coworkers have had some well, got some new books. I can't recall them offhand. I apologize. And they said, "Oh, this is a really good book. So we should be brand new and Ruby is fantastic." In some ways, programming Ruby is, is kind of schizophrenic. a little schizophrenic in, in its description of the language. It's mm -hmm. all around. It's in, in some ways to really learn it. I think kind of what you're saying it's, it's not very concise. I would agree. I um, I tried. I actually I've never gotten all the way through it because I. Like tried to force myself to read it, and I got most of the way through it. And like towards the more like class by class reference stuff, I was like, man, I I don't think this is doing me any. I'm wasting time when I could be like writing some stupid little program and learning more about the language than reading about how this class works or whatever. Plus, K and R is like this thick, and there's something about it. Only although I still haven't gotten through it because I haven't really. Uh, gotten a good start on it, but there's something about looking at it, you're like, oh, I could, I mean, I could finish that this weekend, and you probably won't, but I don't know if you do all the exercises, but. What's KNR? Uh, we might get to that later, but KNR is a book, it really is called KNR because it uh, it's written by Kernigan and Ritchie, okay. um, and it is called the C Programming Language, oh, right. so it's a C book, uh, but it's, it's a, it's sort of, as far as a specific language book goes, it's, it's really what everybody should try to be, probably, in my opinion. It's kind of the pinnacle of, of you know, a single book that eloquently describes a language very concisely, very exactly, and both the tutorial and the reference. I mean, it's yeah. I read a zillion years ago, but I mean, it's still, I just wish people could achieve that nowadays. And yeah. Seem to. It was written in what, early 80s? Uh, late 70s. 70s? Wow. I think maybe. Still often maybe recommended today. today. Which you can ask this the last few months. Oh, yeah. It's true. Probably uh, 77 can you Can you still find the uh, Chunky Bacon book online? The point you guide to Ruby? Because with you know, a lot of beginners in the back who are going to get my business card later, um, <laughs> that would be a good one probably for the top of the list. Yes, there, it is. I've it's a great It really is. For those who didn't catch that, there's a book called uh, Why, Wise Poignant Guide, guide, guide to Ruby. Um, by a character who called himself Why the Lucky Stiff, who I only refer to him in the past tense because he apparently is still alive and well, but he just completely disappeared yeah. from the interwebs. Yeah, he left the internet entirely. He like, he virtually killed himself. But his book is probably still out there and it's good. And you'll know why I call it the Chunky Bacon book. Uh, it involves, it's really, really quirky. It involves lots of comics. Um, an understatement. <laughs> there's also a really good uh, the beginning of I think the A Press Ruby book. There's did an introduction for that. I think you can find the comic from the introduction online. It's it's pretty good as well. Nice. I got That's a good book trying to read it. <laughs> you what? I said I got vertigo trying to read it. That's possible. <laughs> well, the comics are like on the top and they're kind of in the margin. Yeah. And there's a tutorial on Code School that, mentioned, that references uh, the Chunky Book itself quite a bit. Have you been through the Pointy Guide? Uh, I, I haven't. I've read it, bits and pieces here and there, but I haven't read the whole thing. I'd be really interested to see your like response <laughs> blog posts. Oh, all right, I will respond to it. Excellent. I'll, I'll look it up and, and do a post on it. That'd it be comes great. with a soundtrack. That's it how comes with the, the soundtrack? Is. Yeah. 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 How did I miss the soundtrack? Did you the soundtrack when you're trying to read the book? <laughs> did that increase? Did you do that? Is that yeah. part of the reason you had vertigo? <laughs> it would definitely. It you didn't definitely take the pillow came along with the book when you were doing it. I missed that part. <laughs> yes, it comes with it. Like like the inside of the front page. page. That's awesome. So I guess that's. Yeah. Anybody else have Ruby books they think are necessary? No. Nope. I, I really like Peter Cooper's uh, beginning Ruby book. The yeah, press one. I don't know. Like, I read quite a few Ruby books when I was first starting, and uh, I think that was like the best one for me. Like, it's it's really short at the beginning. Um, just kind of covers all the few language features, and then the rest of it's just like a reference. It's a pretty decent sized book, but it's awesome. Cool. It's a good book. Beginning Ruby, Peter Cooper. Right. Yep. Does a pretty good job of just like yeah, going through the basics, and then 
you want to continue on in this one of the, uh, the more advanced just kind of things and there's that. I had a hard time with the uh, poignant guide. Really? Yeah, I couldn't make it. I've read it twice. <laughs> but I could see how it would be difficult. It's. I think it might be a left brain, right brain thing. If we're still, you know, buying into that left brain, right brain thing. It's some side of the brain versus the other anyway. Right. I yeah, I, I don't think I learned any Ruby from it, but it was entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> no, my favorite, I will say my favorite part of the poignant guide is at one point you build a little game uh, in which you use various symbols as the method names, and then he calls those symbols some sort of weapon, like, uh, I can't remember specifically, but if the symbol looks like it could be some sort of weapon, then he'll call it that. Like, uh, I believe uh, you redefine, you know, like, the plus symbol, and that's your sword, or something, and, and various things like that. So that was kind of, albeit goofy, and something you shouldn't actually do, probably. <laughs> uh, uh, it was kind of, kind of a lot of fun. Uh, all right, so we're going to move on. Will you space bar me? So we're going to start with some of the more technical stuff after we've got past the Ruby. And I asked on the NDRB Twitter yesterday for some suggestions as to what people should read. And Nate here suggested Refactoring by Martin Fowler, which is, I think, could also qualify as a classic, which we'll get to the classics here in a little bit. Um, did he actually do or did somebody else do a Refactoring Ruby that is supposed to be a... I don't know. I think there's is a... If you did it, uh, someone did it. You've read it though. Chunks of it. Cool. Refactoring is allegedly in Java, but it's the the code is almost completely unnecessary to the text. Okay. Anybody else read refactoring? Oh. Just, oh. just you. Well, when you stop by to interview, we have a copy of it that you can. <laughs> 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 Tim. Here suggested these two, clean code and code complete, and he also suggested, if I remember correctly, clean code would probably be uh, something easier for a Rubyist to get into. Um, why is that? I think code complete's a bit older. Uh, I don't know the code examples. I had a harder time following. Clean code is just very. It's it sort of takes a Ruby approach. It's it's very accessible and uh, yeah, it's sort of good stuff that you can just miss. And to be fair, I think there's sort of like a pre-title to clean code, something along the lines of agile thinking in clean code or something like that. So um, if you lean towards capital A agile type stuff, or really even little a agile from a programmer perspective, uh, you'll probably buy into clean code to an extent. And code complete, it's bigger. Code, it's, it's a Microsoft code, press thing. Is, are the codes smaller? Are the codes? Are the codes in Microsoft? I think it's all. I think it's all Java. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe it's not. I think it's pre C sharp. Yeah, so I think it's C plus plus. So those were a few suggestions. And yet, yeah, space because I don't remember what the next slide is anyway. Okay, we'll get to classics in a second. Just to, any other suggestions? Uh, yeah. I haven't actually read it, but I like the author. Um, working effectively with legacy code oh, by yeah. Michael Feathers is uh, good allegedly a good book. I am unfamiliar with that. Are you quite familiar with that? Uh, he's he he. I, I mean, I, I when I've met him, he's talked a lot about like taking spaghetti code and unraveling it a little bit at a time, so that you inherited this big ball of crap and you can make it nice over time. Yeah, you read it. Yeah, you put a test harness around things that you need to change, and he goes into a lot of different uh, details on how you do that, and things that you test black box style, like you know nothing about it, and then you start working towards uh, just cleaning things up one at a time until you have a nice base to work with. It's a good book. Cool. Martin Fowler, and he works at. He works at Groupon now. Yeah, he worked. Uh, <laughs> um, Mike Feathers, he, he worked at Optiva, and Optiva got bought by Groupon because right. all their consultants were at Groupon, so Groupon <laughs> figured out it was cheaper to buy them and give the partners a bunch of money and employ the consultants. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm just terrified, waiting for Group One to implode. And we've mentioned the rails way and the American way so far in slightly derogatory fashion. It's cool. Um, I read the uh, rails tutorial book, the rails tutorial um, It's online for free. It's pretty good. They've got the company videos um, and also the wise wise book. Pretty good. Cool. Yeah, Along those lines, I think. Um, just recently, there's a, a pretty good um, overview on a, a Rails cast that just goes into the basics of like installing Ruby and Rails and the whole stack. Um, and I think points to some resources like that at uh, Rails that people that he's talking about there too. So uh, anybody that's just new and trying to figure out like where do I start, that's a good top level overview of like, what things to be looking while we're on that topic, uh, one, one more mic. Uh, there's an IRC channel on Freenode in DRB or hash in DRB if you are a IRC person if, and if you're new or if you're not new or whatever, you just want to chat. But anyway, you can come on there and some of us are hanging out on there all day. I don't know, I've nothing better to do. What were you going to say? Well, I was just, uh, that Rails tutorial book, I both for that one too, I, was, I wasn't going to mention it because I'm such a newbie. <laughs> Uh, it's it's really good. It, the book's available on Amazon, but don't buy it because it's better to get the the HTML version that's more up to date. And uh, and then Saber Books has the um, the videos that take you through too. So you get both the I mean that's probably left brain right brain thing or some kind of learning channel thing. Right. To be able to see it and work through it in the HTML version, and then also listen to the tutorial. They're both great. Cool. Uh, from a learning Rails perspective, there's also Rails for Zombies, uh, which you may or may not be familiar with, but I believe it's just railsforzombies.com. Um, I haven't actually done it, so <laughs> can't exactly tell you what it entails right now, but it's, I believe, some sort of interactive learn. It's interactive. Yeah. Rails thing. It's, I think that's on a uh, code school yeah, website too now. I like the, uh, the guides too. Just the yeah. Rails guides. On um, what? Oh, yeah. Those are actually really good. Um, most of them, a couple of them are like really, really freaking long, but most of them are fairly like concise overviews of just um, you know what's there. They're fairly well compartmentalized, you know, by subject or whatever, and they're usually kept up to date. Yeah. Quite well as well. So. I actually really appreciate those as well as their accompanying uh, authority as far as Google is concerned. So that when I search for something. And that pops up within the first five links instead of blog posts from 2006. <laughs> so yeah, those are those are great. Railsguides.com, I believe. Hey, yeah. Sure. Google we'll for Rails guides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. It's AOL keyword Rails. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> Any other technical book suggestions? We're gonna get to classics in a second. So if you feel like you have one that should be considered a classic. Um, maybe if you struggle with like UI stuff, like I've always sucked at UI, and so I've spent the last year trying to not suck at it. Mm -hmm. But the book that was real helpful to me was just a list of like a hundred things that people do with CSS that are common. Like, there's stupid crap like highlight, making highlighting a whole row in a table, and you know, two column layouts, and I mean a lot of it's really pretty basic stuff. But that helped me a lot just to read through and then and it was because it's an anthology you can just like when you come up with something that you want to do you just find it in the book and copy it and then you kind of learn it and I found that was real it was real helpful to me that sounds like it would be very helpful when I've gone from complete idiot to pretty decent actually it <laughs> it's called uh, 101 essential tips tricks and hacks the CSS anthology yeah. Along, if you just Google explore the uh, sorry, not sorry, explore the sort of UI side of things just a little bit. Um, has anyone here? And I unfortunately, Joel Metter is sick, or he would chime in. I'm pretty sure. Has anybody read Design for Hackers? Recently released, David Kadavi, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, well, anyway, I've heard very good things. I haven't read it myself. I did petition the library to buy it. <laughs> uh, I guess because I'm cheap, I should pay the man. But uh, uh, the, I sort of 
I'm excited about it despite that I clearly am not excited enough to have read it. Uh, because it started with some blog posts that got popular on Hacker News, if you're familiar. Uh, because he essentially is one of the few uh, designers or UI people that I've found, at least, that are capable of uh, doing a good job of explaining uh, design and whatnot in a way that I would understand more from, I guess, an engineering or something like that perspective. So design for hackers, I believe, is the book. Anybody else into uh, UI books of any sort? I was going to dive in. A couple of like, intermediate Ruby books. Uh, metaprogramming Ruby is really good because it sort of just gets under the hood of how Ruby works, the classes, what is kernel, what's object. Uh, Ruby best practices was pretty good. Just sort of seeing some code, good ways to do things using blocks. And then uh, design patterns in Ruby was nice because it talks about the Gang of Four stuff, but how Ruby would implement it because some of it is you'd do it in Ruby a lot different than Java. So that's a good one. And probably uh, the design pattern book has like a one chapter on Ruby. It was probably the best explanation of just the Ruby language, hashes, arrays, all of that stuff. Very concise, so that's pretty good. So another thing that helped me in my CSS enlightenment was CSSZenGarden.com, which is like the right. same page done a bazillion different ways. That was really super helpful. Cool. I feel like UI, CSS type stuff is, is one of the areas where they're is the most room for improvement in structure. Um, and, and you're seeing it with things like SCSS and less, um, adding some structure to it. But I, I still don't think there's a lot of um, well-known or kind of um, standard methodologies to how you should structure your CSS, you know, on the hierarchy of it, how that should be organized, how that, and how that should be Kind of correlated with your actual design creation and that would well. I'd like to see more of that, more of that kind of happening. I've seen a few gems and stuff like that that are starting to touch on those things a little bit, but, but I'm hoping that's something that will improve a lot. Let's move on to classics. So, classics of programming, classic programming books uh, that. A lot of people will mention, oh, you have to read this book uh, to call yourself a professional programmer. Um, I will admit, right up front, I haven't read like any of the classics. Uh, not really, any, not any of the technical classics anyway. Um, there are some soft classics that I've read that we'll get to. But uh, So one of the big ones is Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. People are familiar with that particular text. It's very lispy. Uh, it used to be, up until very recently, within the past year, I believe, the book uh, for intro to CS at MIT. Um, I forget what they're doing now. Python, I think. I don't know what the book is, but they use Python. Interesting. I feel like that should be kind of sad in a way, but I'm sure it's not. <laughs> um, anybody read this? I tried. I read like a chapter. like. Some people on the interwebs were like, let's have this group reading and then talk about it via Google Groups or something. And like, I got a chapter and I was like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but there are, uh, I believe you can get it for free, uh, and there are accompanying lectures from one of the authors that I've heard are excellent. Um, so, how about Design Patterns, the Gang of Four book? I didn't want to write out all the authors' names. How do you guys feel about that book? Is it a classic? Do yeah. we have to read it? It's. I have strong opinions on design patterns that are contrary to most people, so I probably should have just not said anything. No, that is what is interesting. Though. I think it's the most dangerous book in all of computer science. Really? Because if somebody receives the book before they're ready for it, then they approach every problem with, stop, stop what you're doing. We've got to talk about design patterns first. And you can't get anything done because your brain is so full of design patterns. You know, when people talk about when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, give somebody who's not ready for it design patterns and you will learn what that phrase means because everything has to be decomposed in design patterns. And then if you're kind of more mature than where you really need the design pattern, but like you read it and it's interesting and you're like, oh yeah, all those things that I already sort of do. And there are a couple that are probably interesting and make you think about things in more structured ways, but 
like there's this real narrow band where the book is really really useful because you're mature enough not to abuse it but you're you know you, but it still has a lot of new content as opposed to just sort of providing you with confirmation bias it's uh it's kind of like metaprogramming in a way like there's a there's a narrow window where you have to do everything with metaprogramming and and it's dangerous before then and after then kind of you know when it's appropriate without someone having to tell you you can make the same argument about anything you can say about rails development right so someone who you know knows almost nothing about web development or scaling servers or developing developing says oh wow rails cool is there anything used to active record and all that? Barely knows anything about SQL, and they create this nice little cool app that you know, form at all. So there are you know, people. They, they want to do everything in Rails. Right. So so there, there are people who probably shouldn't be writing stuff in Rails until they know a little bit more about what they're doing, and learning Rails can be a good way to learn what you're doing. But like, I don't feel like you reach a point where you say, "Oh, that Rails is stupid. I don't need that. I write all of my stuff directly in in uh, you know rack." No, I mean, I mean, there's always that kind of you know the. The shiny bottle syndrome. You know, ooh, shiny new toy. Like, you know, for .NET developers, like <coughs> Link. You know, ooh, wow, Link is so cool. And you know, if, if, if .NET developers directly that, that, that started using Link a bunch of things, but when they had no business using Link, there's just no reason. It's, it's cool as a research project for Anders and all that, but but as for functional code, it, it's there's limited uses. So at a certain point, I mean, the developers, we're, we're plus are just geeks when we see anything new and cool we want to play with it. And so I don't you know I don't know if the dark about design power, which I mean I agree with to a certain extent. I'm just saying I think you can apply that to almost anything that I can mean, see. Because it, it is the same thing. It's like you've got a hammer, everything is nailed all of a sudden. I, I see your point without completely is. conceding it. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but I don't necessarily agree. I think yeah, I've seen the same thing with, in almost all aspects. With, with 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 some there, I think there are some things like the design patterns book where you're mature enough where you can read it without it becoming the shiny new toy you have to use everywhere. You can read it and absorb it into what you already know, and it and, it, and it's useful without being dangerous. I, I would say more dangerous would be the pen team Yes. So yes. I read I read so this book. Yeah, never, that would be more dangerous. Yeah. Whereas someone say, someone saying, oh, I I want to use you know I need a factory pattern. Oh. I need this pattern and doing yeah. all that, it's not necessarily going to you know, turn your code into complete total shape. Right. Whereas dependency injection could. In fact, if they're new enough, to if, if they're new enough that they're obsessed with design patterns, if they finally are able to write code despite having just read design patterns, their code will probably be the best code they've ever written. It may be using the wrong pattern because they haven't gotten to that chapter yet, but it'll be great code <laughs> compared to what they were producing before. But yeah, dependency injection. Um, some people never grow out of that. So there are people who still use Spring. I, I read this book a, a long time ago, probably when it was new, and <laughs> went through that stage. And I just wish they hadn't called it design patterns because I felt it was more useful for describing code that was already written and helping you understand what it was doing than for telling you how to write code to solve a problem. Like I go in, I don't, I've been writing software since I was 11. And I can't recall a time when I looked at a problem and I thought, oh, that's a factory pattern. You know, it was more like I mess around with a, with a problem and I keep refactoring the code and then I look at it and I'm like, oh, it was a factory. Right? And then someone else comes along and they're like, what's this code doing? And I must say, well, functionally it's doing this, but technically it's this pattern. And so I just wish they hadn't called it design patterns. Called it something patterns, but not design patterns, because you get this mindset that you go and you look at a problem, and then before you write code, you figure out what pattern it is, and then you use that pattern to write the code. And it doesn't, right. it doesn't work that way. That's not how anybody codes. It's how Siegel architects think, you know? They swoop in, they poop out a pattern, and they fly away. And that's not, that's not, that's not real software. I've never heard that one before. I, I oh, didn't oh. It. That's from uh, Johanna Rothman. I didn't make that joke. It's a very good show. It was very good. Um, I read the I read the game before. I, I think it's a really interesting book. Um, there's also another book. Uh, it's a fairly more recent book. It's called Design Patterns in Java by Eric Friedman. Uh, it's a, I'd say it's a much more benign way of uh, introducing design patterns. 
Uh, both of them are interesting in different ways of the giving of design characters. And uh, Game of Thrones has really made a lot of impact on a lot of people. It, it, that time when they were that it was fairly new. And <coughs> the concept of design characters, uh, I think this is why a lot of people feel this way. Uh, that you know, we should like design first and things like that. But um, at that time, I'd say it, it was kind of like revolutionary. Because it impacted a lot of people uh, in, in terms of uh, using design patterns or like applying design patterns. Um, but yes, I'd say design patterns in Java by like, even is, is, is a much more like recent innovation. Uh, I think it's really good. It's much more. Cool. And then he also mentioned the design patterns in Ruby, right, Tim? By a guy who writes Ruby. Ruby. Huh? That was an easier read. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I think it's a lot more. I haven't read. All, either of them in, in, in total, but I've heard from guys who have that the design pattern for Ruby is just a more practical one for just your everyday stuff. Okay. It's, it's easier to see how it could actually apply to what you're doing, and, and you're right, usually you're not going to come and look at some some business problem and say, oh, that's going to be a factory pattern. Um, but it's also, you know, design happens the whole time you write software. Right. Every time you refactor, you're designing. You're redesigning what you just did, so. I think the design patterns are really better. I, I collect a lot of books. I don't read them, but I collect them. <laughs> hey, speaking of, thank you for the segue. This is a book I own. This is a book I've cracked three or four times. and But something always comes up. Uh, and I don't blame the book. Something always comes up and I don't get it finished. But we touched on it earlier. You love K and R, right? I mean, I read it since it came out. Right, yeah, that's fine. But, I mean, you enjoyed I mean, it when you read it. I mean, yeah, I mean, when I read it, it was like, wow, this is just an awful book. Just read straight through it. It was like, it just felt like you did really well, and plus it was still a really great reference. I mean, it's just a book that you can just read from beginning to end, learn a language really well, and, and be able to use it easily as a reference. It's, it's a no small feat. Has anybody else been through Kanar? Yeah, I. Um was I read the I'd never written any C before in my life had to take a C test read the K and R book the night before uh, but didn't make it all the way through I stopped right before the chapter on functions so after the test I got called into the professor's office and Mr. A cup in this department we do not use go to <laughs> <laughs> but in like two hours of reading I was able to learn enough C that all of like all my answers were technically correct, I just <laughs> didn't have any functions. In them. <laughs> so that it's a it's a great book because of that. I mean, you finish reading it and your first thought is, "Wow, now I know how computers work." And then as long as you never touch another computer again, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the book? Um, well, I started proving like QBasic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right. You know, I was like. Um, this is probably like the best book that I've read. It's like it's really uh, good to know the programming language we really well. Cool. Yeah. So it would be even more Really, it was almost hoping there was going to be someone who was like, man, I hate that book. <laughs> because I've never, I don't never heard of anybody saying, oh, you should not read the k and book. Even people who are like, oh, you're never going to do anything with C, you still might read it. <laughs> Uh, any other classics? Yeah. Um, it's the Algorithm Design Manual by Steven Skeena. It's a really good book. Uh, it's almost like a professional sort of reading where you know, you, 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 in every chapter he would give you a, a problem that you could apply to the algorithm. Uh, things are a really good read. Uh, Interaction to Algorithm is a Carmen book. It's like, um, it's a really big one. And, yeah. Uh, I haven't, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's more like a reference. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of both of those, and I wasn't sure. I was going to ask you if you didn't mention introduction to algorithms, how you felt, how they, how they compared. If I remember correctly, introduction to algorithms is like, I don't know, the one that like maybe junior computer science undergrads like hit the freshman in the head with or something. It's, it's huge. Other classics. I don't see the least books. This is very true. Uh, like the art of computer programming, that is not on here. Yeah, you had the image. It's in my picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I just wanted you to bring it up. Have you read it? 
No, I, I, I own... <laughs> Is it finished? I own the first Some three volumes. <laughs> but I've never read them. Okay. Um, I, so I'm, uh, this, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a classic. I'm just happy to be reading a book right now called Coders at Work. Um, and I just finished, I believe, the Douglas Crockford chapter. And he said uh, that he tried at one of his jobs, maybe it wasn't at Yahoo. It was before Yahoo. Uh, I can't remember who that was for, maybe um, Electric Communities or somebody. But he tried to suggest to the hiring team uh, on, on which he had a chair, uh, we should require that people be at least familiar with uh, the things Newth has written and some of his books and whatnot and know what he was all about. And he said, and then I tried, I tried that during an interview and realized that nobody knows anything about Donald Newth except for me, it seems like, which was really disappointing. <laughs> so has anybody else read any? Donald Newth stuff. I'm starting. Uh, Z Chrissy got the probably one of the books for Christmas. So Very cool. We'll probably work on that in between, uh, or it kind of intersperse some other uh, more light reading books in between. Right, like uh, C Spot Run or something. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, I understand. My brain is melted. I'm gonna. Any any other classics? Like I have one that's not a classic, really. Oh, sorry. Um, I had one on uh, the design pattern one. I didn't get this. And um, mm -hmm. um, what was an epiphany for me for the design patterns? Like, I don't know if anybody else is like this, but um, a developer I respected once said, if a book's too thick, then it probably shouldn't be read. So, like, I, I always try to go for the smaller books because those are accomplishable. You know, you can read through the smaller books. And the design patterns getting a four is it's pretty big. So. The, uh, there is a, a small, I don't know if you guys heard of it, uh, Design Patterns Explained. That one, going through it, um, it, it starts off with explaining architecture and what makes good, and when I say architecture, I mean like buildings. So what makes a good design? What makes a window look good compared to something that's not? What is it that, uh, that makes a design you know, better than another design? And actually approaching it from that um, way and building it from, from what looks like a good, um, what makes a good design, and that's caused me to think about my code in a way that um, that when I look at it, I can tell right away, like, wow, the flow of this logic is just so nice. Like, I can see that this is a, you know, following uh, the clean code practices. It, you know, it, it looks this is a good design, and it tells you kind of like what elements to look for. So that was a really good book for me. It doesn't go through all the all the patterns like the uh, Gang of Four ones does, but it, it starts off with a problem, and the guy keeps on adding features to the problem that the current implementation won't support. And uh, based off that, you build out from it, and you can see how the pieces fit together. It's just, it's really cool, and it's short, so I, I recommend that one. Cool. Design patterns explained? Yes, there's a second edition now. Mr. Moore? Yeah, the one I was going to mention, uh, it's more of a tutorial thing, it's called Learn Ruby the Hard Way. I can't remember who wrote it, but I was going through it online a few months ago, and it's really helpful. Is it it's, uh, Yeah. Yeah, as you say. It's translated. Did he write that one or just the Python one? No, he translated. It was translated from, like, nice. Yeah, yeah. Zed Shaw, though. <laughs> how he did the Python one. <laughs> how, how, His is pretty good. Is there lots of cursing in it? Because I just assume. smart guy. I don't think he's just I think angry. angry. It's like every every other sentence is something along the lines of, God, I'm awesome. <laughs> he's, he, he's a lot like DHH, except he's angry and arrogant. <laughs> Really? <laughs> <laughs> now, how many of you guys have read less than half of your books? Yeah, from No, I, I, I always get a few chapters in. in. Not anymore, I took a bunch of half-price half books. <laughs> half the books I own are less than half of the, like, only halfway through the book. Yeah, if you haven't gotten halfway through, it doesn't count as reading it. <laughs> yeah. Well, are books, they're just... They're kind of tombstones of good intentions. Um, oh, I knew we were going to eventually get to the demise of books talk. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch. My, my spare bandwidth, the bulk of my spare time is, is my drive time. I mean, as someone trying to learn Ruby, this is an interesting reading list, but I think my time's better spent in the shell. Yeah. Well, I would, I would advocate that for almost any language that you're trying to learn, but I don't. Me and technical, me and programming language books don't get along with so, I think many technical books take a lot of deliberate um, focus. 
to, to work on. And since for a lot of people, you know, what you're dealing with every day, you're writing code, you're reading code, you end up absorbing quite a bit of what you need to get better. Um, and so then on top of that, you know, uh, going and reading through one of these books, I mean, pretty much you can't do it all at once. It's something that you're probably going to take weeks or months to, to go through, you know, a couple hours here, a couple hours there. Um, so it gets pretty difficult. So I find a lot of people have a lot of book recommendations, but then right. actually having read through them is, is much more difficult. That's where I think books that give, uh, I noticed a lot of people are bringing up books that give them kind of like a different perspective yeah. um, on what they're doing, um, and, and finding those very valuable, um, because it's something you don't necessarily get from just performing tasks. It's mm -hmm. something, seeing seeing the tasks you're performing in a different light, from a different angle, um, or in a, you know, a larger context or whatever, can be very, very valuable to people. That, on that note, I should have mentioned this earlier. I haven't actually gotten through it, so this is sort of cheating. Um, the Little Schemer is sort of about scheme, uh, but it has a really interesting format in that it's not a page of text and a page of text and a page of text and then an example and a page of text. It's actually each page is like a table, and on one in one column you have questions, um, and it'll ask you. Like, what is the car of L if L is this list? Which doesn't make any sense to you, but just that's one of the questions. Or maybe it makes sense to some of you. And then the right-hand side will have an answer. And so you can take, like, an index card or something and cover up the right-hand side and read the question and then read the answer. And it builds so that you won't know the first question in a new topic. You won't have any idea what the answer is. And so you just look at the answer. And then from there, you can start to figure out what's happening. And it sort of snowballs down the page and through the rest of that. Uh, section to the point where you're putting together more and more complicated things including stuff from other sections that you've already learned but really all you're doing is I mean it's Socratic method to the core you're getting asked a question and you're answering it and then checking your answer and it's kind of really cool and I really like it so far but in any case now that we've talked about how kind of books actually suck and we should quit talking about them let's move on to the next slide this is a little bit of the softer classic so I have read that one mythical man month uh, so these are more along the lines of um, making yourself better, making your business better, making your project better, that sort of stuff. And I've read this one. Uh, I actually haven't read that one, which I feel like I should be embarrassed about. I read about the first chapter. It's more of a theoretical book and I have a hard time with that. Which one? This one? Yeah. I like to do stuff I thought it was great. You know the short. Too. Do people still feel like this is relevant? People still recommend it. It is relevant for the quote that you cannot what you cannot have a baby in one month with nine mothers or something. Right. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I had throwing late people more people at a project only makes it later. At a late project makes it later. Right. I feel like I've read enough excerpts from Mythical Man Month just in strolling around the internet. Like I feel like I've read the whole book. <laughs> right. I should probably read the whole book. There are probably some parts I'm missing. I enjoyed it. Um, I may have enjoyed the anecdotes, uh, like stuff that Fred Brooks had went through that shaped his his feelings on the topic, maybe even more than I did. But like if you read, you know, even Richard Berman explained, which I realize I may be biased in putting this under software classics or under classics at all. Maybe it's not a classic, I kind of like it. Um, but if you've read something like that or any, any agile related books, I mean, you can, and then you were to go back and read this, you'd kind of be like, well, I know most of this stuff. But it's kind of interesting to see, like, I don't know if this is sacrilege or something, but I, I would say he's kind of maybe the, uh, the godfather of agile methodologies. Some of the stuff in that book has, has become really universal, and people don't r realize where it came from. Right. I mean, we, uh, we outsourced some stuff to a company in the Ukraine, and we were talking to him on the phone one day and had some changes that we wanted made. And the guy did it. Justin, this is crazy. Nine women cannot make baby in one month. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably the best outsourcing moment I, that we've ever had. That's awesome. I really appreciate that you did the accident. <laughs> I was a little afraid. I was a little scared. <laughs> I decided to pull speed ahead. Yeah, I, I, you should do more accents in the future. So Any other uh, guy, does he say, he's, he's just picky. Yeah. Yeah. 
T- huh? the commercials. Oh, TV. I'm sorry. I don't know how you do TV. It's funny what he said. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> yeah. Any other softer classics, if you will, less technical, or maybe business or something along those lines. I don't know if it qualifies as a classic, but if you're starting your own software yes. related business, then two books you should read are Space Party, Rework, yeah. and um, Lean Real Startup. <laughs> I thought we might get to those. Rework is is a it's the only sort of technical book in the last year I actually finished. Nice. I have read Rework. Like 20 minutes. Yeah. I, didn't, like, I read it in the bathroom. One chapter per trip. Right? Yeah, the, the chapters are only like two pages long. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm gonna read it in the bathroom. Right page is always like one sentence, right page is a little, a few yeah. paragraphs. And then some pages yeah. have pictures on them. Huge, huge graphics. The whole page is a picture. I think it had <laughs> little stickers. It's a lot of money off that. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I'm, I'm sorry. The only reason, reason, no, I, I mean, it is, I it is actually a great book. It's awesome. Right? Because it gets rid of all that dumb shit. The only and thing it's, I didn't like about it was that I got it and I was all excited about it, and then I was like, Oh god, this is just regurgitation of everything I already knew. Yeah. Talking about forever, which was, I mean, it was fine. They put it all together, but I was like, I, I definitely didn't learn anything from this reading here. Right. But I guess it sort of reinforced something. It's actually like if you just, if you feel like you really need to give yourself, like if you're trying to start your own business, or maybe, honestly, if you're just, if you really want to work really hard for the next couple months, like it's a good little pep talk book. Yeah. It's not going to take very long, so. Just like crack it open one morning, and uh, you probably finish it before you finish your coffee, and then like you're like, yes, this is awesome. I feel great. I'm going to do all of these things that they said to do or not do, which is more of what they're telling you. And you can read it like more than once, and it's like you know if you're like like I'm running three businesses plus I have a job, and I and every time I read it, I'm like. Sometimes I just randomly pick it up and I'll read it. I'm like, oh crap, I gotta stop doing this. <laughs> you know, it's just like it's very helpful to me. What book is that? Uh, Rework by no, no, no. by yeah, I've got Rework. Jason Fried and uh, okay. uh, David Hanlon Hanson. Sounds great. It's good. Getting Real, uh, which I've read bits and pieces of, is actually pretty similar. It's Am online. I correct? Yeah. Like, it's online yeah. and it's free. Okay. You can, you can read it online. Getting real, you can read online for free. It's sort of like, um, let's let's call rework maybe getting real 2.0. Yeah, they're Only, all short essays. Yeah, it's still good stuff. Um, these were suggested. These first three, well, obviously lean startups have been suggested also by Dave, but they were all suggested by Chris Minoy as well, who uh, runs Montabi. What Montabi? M O N T A B E is a Photo gallery. Twitter photo gallery thing. Just go to the site. Has <laughs> uh, so anybody read Crush It or Crossing the Chasm? Crush It. So you both read Crush It? Is that where you both? Good? Worth it? Okay. It was kind of a hype machine. <laughs> okay. You could watch the. Like you could watch the what was it Rails Conf two years ago? Yeah. Watch it, listen to his talk, and you get all pumped up. And like, okay. I think I got most of it. I kind of got the feeling it was like creatine for programmers. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> they should sell that book in like aerosol form. <laughs> the little motivation. All right, uh, let's do this. It's called cocaine. All right. Um, Apprenticeship patterns was suggested by Matt Swanson. Not related to someone else's last name. More. I'm not familiar with it. Anybody familiar with apprenticeship patterns? No? I heard Jake Hoover him. talk at SCNA about the apprenticeship that they do at Optiva slash now Groupon. And I liked his, um, I liked the way he described what they do. So if you have to take young kids and turn them into good programmers, it might be a good book, just based on talking to him. Interesting. I'll have to talk to Matt about what he thought of it. Um, and we covered getting real. That's uh, space farming. I'm not I sure. I finally remembered that I read the, uh, the mythical man <laughs> going back one slide. But, uh, it was mind blowing. So I, I very much enjoyed about that book how uh, 
anecdotes? It, it was written in the it was written in the seventies or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it was very clear. Like you can read it now and see what like a lot of the ideas are still exceedingly relevant today. And uh, including his one uh, anecdote about how they, he was like, well, we're not really sure. Like this is a relevant topic at the time. He's like. We're not really sure if it's going to be worth the you know memory and, and CPU cycles to uh, you know, have an operating system here, and it's like just crap like that that we take for granted now that you know they were struggling with at the time. But you can see even those problems, they were having all these issues that you still see today. Yeah. And so it was it was kind of like it was looking at ancient society and being like, <laughs> hey, things haven't really changed that much. Right. The specific problem doesn't really matter. Just the way they were thinking about it is the same. Yeah, and if you like that sort of thing, I really, again, I'm only like four chapters in, but Coders at Work has been really interesting to me. Like, I like reading uh, what sort of struggles people went through when memory and, and CPUs were big constraints, like, and they didn't have the op the op opportunity to just distribute things to uh, 40 uh, servers on AWS or something like that, you know. It could be really interesting. It sounds like it would be helpful if everybody like read these books, but you know, people want to get around to it but haven't. Maybe we should start like a book club. Like you read five of these books, you get like a pizza. Um, oh, I actually, what I'm, I'll read. <laughs> book it, you okay. say? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'll read. I'll read a book, and you read a different book, and then I'll tell you about the one I read, and you tell me about the one you read, course. and then I'm going to count that. Awesome. Yes. So if you read it, it's very short uh, out there on the interwebs, uh, the story of Mel, the real programmer. I don't, I don't. Because if you like anecdotes about constraint space, it is the ultimate anecdote about really? real, real Wild West programming. Nice. Yeah. He like, talks about like the, the when things were on cylinder. Yeah, drum memory. He would arrange his loops so that if he needed more time or something to propagate, he made it so that the instruction that you needed next was the one immediately before the instruction that just called. So he'd have to wait for the entire drum to rotate. Like, <laughs> really, that's crazy. great read, though. Great <laughs> read. Because it's written by the guy who took over after Mel. And so he's like, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to read this code, and I... Like Mel's so much smarter than I am, I can't do anything with this code. <laughs> uh, it's it's a great read, and very much the opposite of refactoring and programming patterns. It's him saying, you know, here's a guy who knew exactly what every detail of the system was at every nanosecond that it was functioning, and he didn't need any of this stuff. He wrote code that was perfect. It can never be touched again. <laughs> but as long as it can stay in the state it is now, like. Refactoring would be bad for Mel, right? Um, so it is the only counter argument I've ever seen, and it's w worth reading. I thought it was interesting uh, that Jamie Zawinski, you're familiar with him, um, who was on like the Netscape Navigator project and whatnot. Yes. Uh, quit programming and runs a nightclub because basically because of what happened with Netscape, because he was like, man, there's a lot of politics you have to deal with. So I'm just going to own a nightclub, <laughs> because this sucks. So the interview, he's the first chapter in Coders at Work. And so it's kind of weird, because some of the questions that he gets asked, he's like, well, uh, I guess if I were going to start doing programming again, I would do this. <laughs> it's like, ugh, awkward. <laughs> well, I'm finished. Um, yeah, did you have? I think everyone should be required to read why I hate frameworks by Joel on software. It's just an essay about frameworks and it talks about patterns a lot. And it's, it should be required reading for everyone. I feel like that might have been... Is that, that contained in one of like, the compilation books? Maybe. I don't it's just, if you just Google why I hate frameworks or God, build a hammer with Java, it's like this essay of if we were going to build a hammer with Java, we wouldn't just build a hammer. We'd be able to build a factory that builds hammers and then we'd build a factory that makes a factory for building hammers and <laughs> it's funny and it's like one of those things that you know makes you think about patterns a lot. Do you think sometimes to an extent you need someone to explain Joel for you first before you read him? Do people still like Joel Spolsky? I when I first read him like people were like oh read this post I was like good god he sounds I can't stand this man. I like Joel Spolsky mm -hmm. and then after the wasabi post I started to read his posts more critically, 
and realize that I don't like Joel's poster. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about Bob Mark. Okay. You'll notice yeah, that uh, he also put out a uh, bug tracking song for it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you've heard about it. What's that? The quality of his programming post dropped dramatically, somewhat in coinciding with him releasing bug tracking software, which I find very amusing. Yeah. I find his post extreme. I, I find him to be a very entertaining you know, person, and, and I've just seen some videos of him speaking, very charismatic, but I mean, like a lot of those people, <coughs> kind of, it's almost kind of a cultish following behind them, and I, just, I, I, I think anybody like that you can't get too tied up in. David Rails, the ability of that. Well, he, he was the reality of the walking around him. He's the most brilliant person in the world. We recently put out a compilation book called, called Beautiful Writing in Software or something along those lines. It was really good. It's, it's kind of like Coders at Work, but it's about writing and stuff. So, that sounds cool. Pull parts from other books and blog posts and things like that. Well, I'm finished. Did, did you two, Nate and Dave, both just talked about maybe talking about something. Are you still interested in doing that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Where What's the time like? I don't know what time you guys leave. It's 8.26. I mean, I talked forever. We could probably be done now and be fine if we just <laughs> didn't feel like talking. I don't care. I, I will say, after interrupting you anyway, I am done talking. <laughs>